Hello, listener. So, you like scary movies? Well, it is a creepy night, and with all those crazy lunatics out there, well, you really shouldn't be alone. Ooh, you look so freaked out right now. <laughs> now I suggest you listen very carefully. Subscribe to Class Horror Cast, or I'll gut you like a fish. Enjoy the show. I'll be watching. <laughs> Welcome back to Class Horrorcast. I'm your host, Aaron, and in this week's episode, we are joined by movie royalty, Mr. Keith Coogan. Best known for his role as Brad in Adventures of Babysitting and Kenny in Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead, Keith also starred in one of the most loved episodes of Tales from the Crypt. He is a vault of knowledge on film and show business. He tells of how razor close he got to starring in both The Shining and The Friday the 13th. He tells some incredible stories and behind the scenes of his long and illustrious career so far and his future plans. Join me as I chat with movie royalty. You won't want to miss this one. Can you remember the first horror movie that you ever seen? Oh, uh, probably Exorcist. Um, Yes, I think it was definitely The Exorcist that I can remember seeing. Um, And we were Catholics, so... That was very like yeah. possible, I guess. It cried, you know, and there was very good verisimilitude. There was no like special effects; it was mm-hmm. all practical effects. So it just shot beautifully um, and uh, uh, very intense. And I don't think it needed extra features. I've seen the you know backwards crawling down the stairs and whatever yeah. extra things they put in um, unnecessary. The, I saw a great thing that said. Who are they asking? I think it was Christopher Nolan, and they were asking about alternate versions and this mm-hmm. or that. And I, and I think he said, "Well, really, it's the version that you had to under the gun have a release date and get in theaters." And he yeah. really said, "I think because you could monkey around with something forever and tinker with a movie forever. So what mm-hmm. version? You know, everything changes. But for when the movie came out on that date at that time with these resources, this is what I could deliver." And I think that's the clearest statement of a director, unless it's been taken over by a studio and completely, um, you know, uh, manhandled in a back alley. What do you remember your uh, initial reactions to seeing The Exorcist being? Were you uh, intrigued by horror or turned off? The adults. Usually it's how it affected the adults. Sure, it terrified me. I think the earliest memory of a nightmare based off of just an ad for a movie was... Nightmare on Elm Street, there's a bit where he presses through the wall yeah. above her bed. Uh-huh. And that got into my dreams and my nightmares. And of course, the very nature that it's about nightmares and misunderstood teenagers and everything. So that Nightmare on Elm Street, although because I was raised, I was 10 when um, uh, 9 or 10 or 11 when uh, Friday the 13th and mm-hmm. Halloween came out. Those are the really true progenitors to me you need a good bad guy freddy seemed to be wink wink as yeah. west craven is known to do yeah. of like oh you need a bad guy well i got a bad guy for you yeah. and um did i see oh, almost malignant i would say there is a bad guy in malignant that you go this could be one of those mm-hmm. um tentpole horror franchise icons you have me like so I'm like even more Very sold than I already was. I don't know. If, I, am I, I'm not wearing my ACDC shirt, but my first concert was Kiss. I listened to very heavy, heavy. My wife also hates the heavy metal rock music that I listen to. And um, the bad guy in Malignant is very like the crow and nice. Trent Reznor and just very greasy hair and very like, I don't know. It's very rock and roll. Maybe a bit of a, a bit of a strange question, um, <clears throat> and and we don't have to go there if you don't want to. But I know you mentioned that your wife isn't a big fan of uh, scary movies and not a big fan of the rock and roll kind of music. You like, how do you um? Because I've had so many people ask me this question. You know, they've got a partner, or maybe uh, they still live with their parents, or they've got somebody who's not into the same kind of thing, and they struggle to, not that they argue, but they struggle to kind of you know, they love something so much and they kind of feel like, how do I bring myself back from pushing it on somebody too much or having a nice middle ground? Sure. And, um, I think that, uh, 
uh, my wife is very gay. I'm very game and I'll watch all of the Palm Rock movies and the romantic comedies. And I also, I love romantic comedies. Yeah. I love any movie this well. Um, the tropes in those Hallmark movies are very strong. Mm -hmm. I'm like, they're kissing roll credits, pull back into a big <laughs> wide shot with this, you know, full lens flare from the sun. And their, their kissing has got to be silhouetted in the setting sun on the farm that they save because she's a city girl, but she doesn't have time for her family. <laughs> and then he's, so it's like, I love those because they just triple down on them. Yeah. They really do. And if there's a format, same with horror, yeah. horror has tropes and format and a, and a visual storytelling you know, the direct reverse is really most used in horror. Mm -hmm. That kind of way of, of crossing the line, it leaves the um, the camera line, it leaves the audience disoriented. It's used in those mirror scares when you open the mirror, then you close the mirror. I love it when they subvert that trope and they'll give you a good mirror scare, nothing, nobody's in it. You're like, damn, and then they step away and there's someone <laughs> standing there. Great stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, oh, So I think the studios are good at knowing that like, for instance, I love um, John Wick, but it can get violent. By three, you've got dogs getting shot. And yeah. so it gets kind of, can be hard for people to watch. Um, heck, after I was in a car wreck once, I had PTSD and couldn't watch horror action or any movies with a gun or a car wreck or a car chase for weeks, maybe months after that. Specifically, anything with like cars and stuff, mm -hmm. it was like, would send me right into that. So I know that people are sensitive. My wife was raised where she wasn't allowed to watch R rated movies. So, and her dad had a video store. So she'd look at the box covers to movies. She couldn't, you know, watch. And like, that was her. And then grew up. And so she has a different, she's very into John Hughes and 16 candles yeah. and breakfast club. And, and as am I. So, uh, studios have done a good job. Like with Kate, uh, Beck and Zales, uh, horror movie, I'm not horror movie, action movie, very John Wicky. They did um, Gunpowder Milkshake, um, which was great. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Gunpowder Milkshake is like, maybe they let one of the Cohen brothers on the set. Uh, yeah, in the middle of this whole John Wick, you know, directed by a second unit director kind of a movie, um, which they're not bad. I'm not dogging on yeah. post-Matrix filmmaking. Um, because I think that 99 was the greatest year in film since 1939. Um, in 99, you had Matrix and American Beauty and um, Office Space and uh, uh, groundbreaking, like some of the best movies had come out in 1999. If you look at this mm -hmm. film list, you'd be like, I didn't know that came out in 99. Um and after Matrix, we had Underworld and its sequels. Um, so studios are like put a pulling in. What did we watch? It was pretty gross. Oh, well, we loved uh, Army of the Dead, which brings one of my favorite genres. You know, I've seen, you know, Italian, what do they call them? Spaghetti zombie yeah. movies. <laughs> like zombie, which is just terrible. There's like second minute footage put in there for no reason from other movies. Um and zombie may be mad. It maybe want to tear down the screen. I don't know if you've seen zombie, mm -hmm. but at the end, the reporter wakes up and the whole movie was a dream and he still hadn't gone to the airport, which was the first attack scene. And he wakes up and he's on his way to the airport. And I went, you just cheated me out of 90 minutes of my life. <laughs> and I went, if you pull that, it made me write like a short story, but if you pull that on us audiences, they would burn the theater. down. <laughs> <laughs> I could see just when you mentioned uh, the year nineteen ninety nine, and I'm I'm a huge fan of the nineties in particular. Um, I'm not I can't really pinpoint why, but just I, I just pulled up uh, some of the movies that came out that year. And you're actually right. I don't think people would realize how many like really good movies came out List that year. Some of them. You've got the Phantom Menace, the Sixth Sense, Toy Story Two, The Matrix, The Mummy, Notting Hill, The World Is Not Enough, American Beauty. Um, Tarzan. And if you just take Six Sense, American Beauty, and there's a symbolism of red. They use red doors, red cars, red flowers, red. There was a there was a visual storytelling, and there's a third movie that did that on that list. Like maybe it was Matrix. 
it was just very using that mm-hmm. color separation imagery to kind of focus. I know Schindler's List did it with the red jacket, but it keep going. It's just the list is so long. Like I am actually shocked because I was like, and they're not oh yeah, the nineties okay movies. They're like great movies. Yep. Um, you had Stephen King, Storm of the Century. Uh, again, fun. again, yeah, again, that that can be debated, maybe, but <laughs> um, cruel intentions. My God, like the, it just seems to be like I would imagine that nineteen ninety nine probably has a lot of people's like at least one of maybe their top five or ten favorite movies. Sure, it's got um, to be. And in thirty nine, you had the filmmaking machine creating greats like Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind. Um. And then in 99, it was the, right, in the 70s, we fired all the director on tours because Michael Cimino brought down United Artists with Heaven's Gate and went over budget. So the producers took over again. But Spielberg, Spielberg lasted through that because he was a producer's director. He finished on time, on budget, mm-hmm. still keep spectacular, you know, sensationalism in filmmaking again. I'm not just here to make a call sheet, but I'm here to make the call sheet. Um, and there's not too much flashy stuff in. Yeah, yeah. There's solid filmmaking in, in that stuff that's in 99. It's solid, but the camera doesn't go whirring around. Um, it has studio budgets on subversive storytelling, which takes us back to the 70s when studios said, these young directors want to run around with a 16 millimeter camera. It's only going to cost us what? Less than a million? Let them do it. We won't even visit the set. And now you had these stories that God knows they're not going to sink 20 million into a picture with that story because it could get negative press or, or catch on. Look, I was raised on um, China syndrome network, the sting. I was told when I, and clockwork orange. Um, mm-hmm. I was told that society lies to you. Those in charge lie to you. The governments lie to you. Don't trust anybody. I was raised by carnies. <laughs> wow. My mom was a runaway, 15-year-old runaway Catholic schoolgirl who got pregnant. And then I was born. She was just 16 when I was born. And uh, and my prenatal care was cotton candy and uh, hot dog on a stick from the carnival that she worked at. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. <laughs> So I loved when um, Silence of the Lambs, which, you know, one of the tr- first horror movies to win, I think it was the second horror movie to win the Best Picture um, Oscar in the U.S. And it, it got accolades across the board and mm-hmm. won the big, you know, acting awards and writing and directing and everything. Um, it has now become, you know, for someone who's not in the genre, a, it'll have to be one of the five big studio, like a Halloween or like a James Wan picture, something that has recognizable names and faces in it. Mm-hmm. Um, the Sock franchise is, was way played out, but um, although I enjoyed the Saw um, five, I think it was. I thought I enjoyed that one. Um, it uh, oh, that studios are. I think they listened to Scorsese when he said Marvel films will be the death of us all. Marvel listened to that and they came up with WandaVision and Falcon and Winter Snowman yeah. and, or whatever, you know, Winter Soldier and I saw Falcon and the Winter Snowman. We have a film called Falcon and the Snowman with Sean Penn. <laughs> <laughs> I always think of that. Um, WandaVision was great. Loki, some of the best science fiction I've ever seen in Loki and that broke all of the, those superhero tropes that Marvel had been building up. So they were listening. They're like, that's way till you see phase four for Marvel. Um, and we're seeing enough independent voices hit the screen. Look at um, Shape of Water. Yeah. One best picture. You got Guillermo del Toro pulling in a best picture Oscar. And he's as subversive and anti-government as you can get. Yeah, true. Uh, just from listening to you talk there, and, and I've... Uh, I've seen you on many a interview podcast or show. Would you say I feel like nobody really mentions this when talking to you or just from forums and stuff? Nobody, I don't think, gives you enough credit for it. Uh, you seem to be so knowledgeable 
uh, in the world of movies and film and not just you know this picture got this and this director and this person done this work and they have this style and and really looking further than just it being a movie uh, i heard you talk about um even in modern day you know things like uh, bloomhouse their marketing strategies the fact that they didn't go the same route you know they weren't going to they weren't going to market to 99% of america's population they were looking for their 10% niche and use the internet and social media and stuff is that something that you keep up with and you have a passion for like seeing all these different things and and kind of knowing everything about the wow well thank you and thank you for being interested in these weird you know and and i am by no means any sort of um um authority on the matter i just tend to see patterns and will piece together the knowledge i've learned i've been in the business since 1975 and I've worked on uh, uh, 80, what is it, 30 films and 50 different TV shows and uh, probably um, 60 commercials for national brands in the U.S. And um, so I understand the – you've heard me say show business, entertainment industry, how they're locked together. It's a very expensive mm-hmm. art form but it's been democratized mm-hmm. uh, because of cheaper gear. I'm looking at the black magic 4k pocket cinema camera. I don't, I couldn't handle a 6k workflow. It would be too much data. It would be too much space. I don't need it. Nobody people. I show my wife. She doesn't even notice when we check into a hotel room and the TV aspect ratio is different and it's squishy or stretched. Yeah. And I go, Oh, and you can't on hotels. You can't adjust the settings of the TV. Yeah, it's very yeah. hard. They, pack you out of that and i'm like i somehow try to get around it and um she, she doesn't even notice that and i'm very particular about mat lines and aspect mm-hmm. ratios and i'm just like oh pan and scan and like growing up i knew what the difference between pan and scan and letterbox and all that stuff was so i do i piece together that and then the economics of it, a studio um and uh, recently I've done a tour guide at Sony Studios for a couple of years. Hopefully to be pick up again when the pandemic lets up. And you overhear tons of scuttlebutt on why something gets made, why something doesn't get made, why people are having maybe trouble on a picture or mm-hmm. not, what a conflict is, how they fixed it. Um, one of my favorite stories was um, the head of Sony, Roth, Mm -hmm. And uh, he wanted Quentin Tarantino's next picture. So it was going to be Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And uh, other studios had been shopping to Tarantino and throwing big numbers at him, whatever you want. And uh, he, he turned to him and he goes, what do you, you know, I want this picture at Sony. I want your next picture at Sony. And I, and I read an article um, like asking a girl out on a prom date like five times. He like kept pitching it to him. And he, and he finally got very specific. He goes, what do you need to make this picture? And he goes, well, I need to recreate Santa Monica, Bo- I mean, uh, Hollywood Boulevard and Hollywood. I need to you know take over a freeway and Hollywood Boulevard and this. And, uh, I, and it wind up to be, what, a $70 million, maybe $90 million with um, P&A. Uh, promotion and advertising and um, he goes done whatever it takes to get what you want on the screen and that's how he got Tarantino over there the story of Tom Cruise and J.J. Abrams on Mission Impossible hearing that one was connected to the other Tom Cruise called up J.J. Abrams and J.J. Abrams was like yeah I want to break story and he goes let's do it right now what are you doing and he came over immediately and it was a three bottle of wine night and they broke story and figured out what they were going to do with Ethan Hunt um, and I love those kind of channels. I would do that to people. They go, Hey, you want to make a short? And I go, sure. When let's do it tomorrow. Let's do it now. What are you doing this afternoon? You know, mm-hmm. I had a little short production company called sauce cost, which stands for shoot on Saturday, cut on Sunday. So oh, you I shoot all that. your footage on Saturday because I, I work Monday through Friday. Um, as a lot of people do. Um, so pulling together financials, market, um, stuff, you know, why, all of a sudden two baseball movies come out at the same time because they were pitched to all the studios 
And one studio said, no, we're not, we have politics with this guy. We can't take his project. But I like the baseball movie. Let's do a baseball project. Boom. That's why two come out of the same. They're afraid of missing out, but they didn't say yes to yeah. the deal. So they, they rip it off. Um, and some of them are frighteningly similar, like No Strings Attached and Friends with Benefits. Those two movies were, came out in the same week, had the same ad campaigns. I couldn't tell you who was in which because they're too similar. I think yeah. Ashton Kutcher maybe was yeah, in that's, one. Yeah, that's I actually know. a really good point. Um, why are so many remakes happening right now? Because, and this was proven in a recent WGA case, the Writers Guild America West, which a lot of the writers live in L.A., they have a clause that 35 years after they write it, that if there's no new exercising of the contract, that it can revert back to the author. Yeah. So we're at the 35-year mark for movies like, well, they did Adventures of Babysitting a couple of years ago. They did Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter is Dead. They're working on now. They just did Ghostbusters again. They, so there's certain movies that they have to grab intellectual property from the 80s and 90s and remake it. If they don't, if they don't make an agreement, they lose those rights back to the original author, and that can include roller coasters, tolls, toys, any ancillary product or something made from that could go with it. It did in a very recent big main licensed brand just happened. I can't remember the movie or the brand, but it was huge. Um, and so that set a legal pre- – we knew this might come – it's now, it's happening now, and the legal precedent has been set, and it was cited with the writer. So, um, you know, expect to see those rebrandings, retitlings, remakings, reboots. I love that I got to be in reboot with Kevin Smith, yeah. who just <laughs> yeah. lampshaded the whole thing. They're doing a bunch of reboots now, kids. They're making them young and fresh and progressive casts. And <laughs> yeah, that, the, I, I, lo- I love his work. I got to meet him and Jason Mewes quite a few years ago. Uh, in Dublin at their live show, uh, I, I I love <clears throat> what I love about about him especially is he he's kind of he he's always been himself. He's never really uh, Kevin Smith always struck me as a kind of guy who is just he he likes something he enjoys it and he doesn't really he, he uh, for the most part I would say he he's never really veered from that. Um. Just when you had mentioned about remakes and things like that, I had a conversation recently with somebody, and I, and I brought up the fact that, uh, and especially in in the horror genre itself, I mean, we've got Halloween Kills um, is due out this weekend. Oh, um, it was Friday the Thirteenth. Yes, it was. That's the property that yeah. just reverted back. That's why we hadn't had a Friday the Thirteenth for a yep. while, and. and uh, yeah. Anyway, go on. Sorry, and yeah, and right that was, yeah, and you're right. And that that case, uh, I was reading into that. That's gotten really messy now. I think because the writer only owns the character from the original movie, so technically, they could remake a movie using certain things and not other things. And it's you just need a big old machete and a hockey mask. And yeah, all that shit is fun because you know what. You know, we all know Jason's mom was the killer in the first one. Yeah, because... And uh, Jason was just a mossy, freaking drowning victim. Yep. <laughs> and apparently that's that. it's come down to that kind of pettiness now, I think. Um, Sean Cunningham now, I think, has something... He's looking into the logistics of the fact that but, the first movie doesn't actually have the hockey thing and the whole... Right. But it's funny. It is petty or money. Um uh, Kevin Smith just recently, I read an article. He said that he, anytime it makes a certain amount of money, lawsuits just start happening. And he's like, God, it's really frustrating because you do something. He's like, no one's suing me over um, yoga hosers, but you make a movie that makes money and all of a sudden they come crawling out of the woodwork. And, and uh, he got sued by, um, I don't even remember what, for what movie. He got sued, Dogma or something. He mm-hmm. got sued. And um, he winds up working with the director, with the producer again, and uh, he's like, "What was that all about?" And the guy goes, "Oh, that's that happens. Water under the bridge. Let's move on." The, like insinuating that for executives, lawsuits are part of business. Like they just help oh, sue them. Sue, just expect well, let's just to hold on to their rights and hold on to their thing. They'll settle. 
but I, you know, you're suing for millions of dollars. They'll settle for a couple hundred grand. A couple, you know, it's just cheaper for them. And intimidating when a huge studio has hundreds of lawyers and hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal funds. And you don't. So Kevin Smith was his eyes and, and mine were open too. And that fear of big, big success. Do you want to be Brad Pitt or Tom Cruise who cannot walk into a 99 cent store? Yeah. Um, oh, I got announced. All right. I have been announced for Rhode Island Comic Con. <laughs> oh, nice. Coming up uh, first uh, week, November 5th through the 7th, Rhode Island. Very cool. Thank you, babe. That's very nice to see. That's oh, a, I, I noticed you've been doing it a lot recently and you've done some horror cons and stuff. And uh, the feedback online seems to be like people are going crazy for it. Oh, it, well, first of all, horror cons are particularly, uh, I think, successful because that niche tends to be pretty fetishistic. I think you've heard me say this before. Yep. Just from that hearing what interviews that you've gleaned some information from, I can tell they buy the dolls, they buy the tin sets, mm-hmm. they buy the whole posters and the thing, and I'm um, sure get autographs, but um, they're pretty loyal. And uh, uh, cons, economically, they'd hit a plateau on customer base because as you said a genre picture um uh is only you know a tenth of the audience that you could reach with a four box four quadrant you know marvel picture um so they started opening up to pop culture stuff and i got a break because don't tell mom the babysitter's dead maybe (laughs) and daniel harris so thank you to daniel harris for getting me in the new jersey horror con and and film festival because of don't tell mom the babysitter's dead and then just did another new jersey horror con daniel couldn't make it but joanna cassidy joined us Mm -hmm. at this show um and she's great in don't tell mom and um so it's a good fit uh people that you know grew up on halloween and friday the 13th they also saw fox and the hound and adventures of babysitting and and that stuff yeah that age group is good for cons and yeah as the pandemic rules open up people are traveling more and working again they have the budget for it huge we did the hollywood show and they had canceled five shows because they used to have three a year so they canceled a total of five finally when they had the show everybody came it was a very busy show yeah i feel like it's good to see those things come back with a bang um there's another thing as well uh i don't know if you noticed but the the twenty seventh of this month is the I want to say that the twenty eighth anniversary of your episode of Tales from the Crypt premiering on HBO. Oh, that's great! Oh, that's great! Oh, that's great! I'll tell my wife. Um, on the twenty seventh of this month is the anniversary of my Tales from the Crypt airing. He thinks it's like the twenty seventh anniversary or some shit tw- like that. Twenty eighth, twenty twenty seventh, or twenty eighth anniversary. Yeah, 28th anniversary, I don't know. Uh, I don't even remember when we shot it. 90, 91, 92? I don't, I don't remember. Interesting. Cool. Um, and cool, cool, cool. Th- that's a, th- there's another thing. So I'm a huge fan of Tales from the Crypt, as I'm sure most people that listen to this show are as well. Um, that episode, though, seems to always come up as one of like everybody's favorite episodes. How was that oh, whole experience... I mean, uh, you can you can go online. I've I've seen some clips online, like really short clips of that episode, that have four or five six hundred comments on YouTube from the past <laughs> from the past twelve months, and every single comment is like, "Oh my god, I I remember this episode. I remember it so vividly. This is my favorite episode. This takes me back." And like everybody has good things to say about it. Um, how was your experience with that whole thing? Well, I was stoked to, I was stoked the whole time. Um, I'm working with Gaines, London, DeLuise, Dylan, Wheaton. Mm-hmm. Um, Who did I leave out? DeLuise, London, Gaines. Uh, we had Salinger. She's great. I'd done a short with her, uh, The Great O'Grady. Imagine if professional spitting replaced football in high school sports. And Meredith Salinger was the cheerleader that I had a crush on, and uh, I learned how to become a, a champion spitter. Um, so anyway, it was great. To, and I went to grade school with Meredith Salinger. Um, actually, yeah, first, second, and third grade with wow. Meredith Salinger. We grew up in the same town. Um, and directed by uh, Gail, um, who I was a big fan of in 1941. 
and uh, and and I want to hold your hand and uh, Back to the Future. Mm-hmm. So Bob Gale was fun. He was just Papa Gale having fun. It was no stress with Bob Gale. He just loved it. He had fun. Two takes and we're out. Yeah. Um, and uh, we got to shoot at the house from Nothing But Trouble, but Dan Aykroyd, um, mm-hmm. John Candy picture, Demi Moore. And um, the frat house uh, was the house from Critters 2, I want to say. <laughs> where Maybe Critters 3, where Leo lived. No, I think it was Critters 2. Uh, and uh, I'm, I love locations, by the way. I'm always fascinated with locations and movie sets and you know, film locations, being in L.A., surrounded by them. Um, our episode was shot after the Billy Zane episode. And mm-hmm. they kept the Crypt Keeper set on the side of the mansion interior. They would redress the mansion interior for whatever episode they needed. Um, and they would kept the Crypt Keeper puppet just sitting there. Oh, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Next to the crypt and the thing and the whole like little mini set. And they can move that around wherever their company was if they needed to shoot a new intro. Um, it looked, it was pretty portable, I guess. I don't know. Maybe, maybe they did. Maybe that's where they shot them all. But that was like a permanent stage that they'd have a utility stage to build most of the interiors that they could. That's it was in it. Marina Del Rey. So, like, I guess it, it coming from a fan's perspective, it's probably it seems maybe more like a no brainer for somebody like me. Um, it was, was horror something that you tried to, I don't want to say stay away from, but was it just something that never really crossed your path and you just kind of. No, um, my, uh, mom, um, did think the shining was a bit too not right for me at the time. Um, and I was close maybe in the top three for the shining. Um, and then I also, it was down to me and Corey Feldman for, um, uh, uh, Friday the 13th final chapter. And, uh, that went to Corey. Um, and I've been up for, um, other horror films. Uh, my mom wasn't too keen on it because she wanted to keep me Disney safe to keep my career so that I could always go pop in and do work for Disney, which has been my most frequent partner in production and I've worked for Paramount and Universal and Disney and Warner Brothers and uh, um, uh, Sony and uh, what are the other ones in town? Um, and I find that uh, Disney is, it just, it's generational. It reaches people forever and ever. Fox and the Hound, I have fans across all generations um, and that I love family entertainment. I've never, I did Cheetah, which is rated G for, yeah. <laughs> for the kids. <laughs> and it came out the same week as lethal weapon Two, Batman returns. Um, some of the movies that out were pretty violent and like not for kids. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we were 10th at the box office <laughs> wow. and, uh, made $10 million. It only cost $3 million to make the movie. Actually, it cost a million and a half to make the movie. Disney bought it uh, for $3 million, and then it made $10 million at the box office. And then it, I uh, heard that not only you know people have VHS or you know DVDs of it, but um, uh, a uh, uh, rehabilitated convict said that they played the cheetah in prisons. Uh, because it's got a lot of exteriors and beautiful outside photography and kids and not like any, you know, sort of um, uh, criminality to it. So Yeah, I can see <laughs> that making poachers, sense. Those damn poachers. Uh, and while I was doing, um, was I, work- I was working on Cheetah. Uh, on the way home, we stopped in um, Dublin, Paris. London and uh, Frankfurt and did a little mini tour to promote a night in the town, which was releasing at that time. Uh, I think 88, uh, early 88 it, uh, was released in Ireland. And I wound up going to Dublin and doing radio and TV and uh, <laughs> learning a little bit about my homeland. Uh, I mean, I'm plastic Irish. I was never raised there, but I am, um, there, my family's from Kilkenny, 
Oh, nice. And we have dated uh, the, there was a census in New York that tracked a Coogan from born in 1921, who at 30 got on the boat in 1851 and came to Syracuse, New York. So 1821, and then you can't go back too much further from that because the records are all gone. Mm-hmm. The Catholic records are burnt. The church records are burnt. Marriage birth certificates gone, trashed, burnt. Um, and by the way, uh, Dairy Girls is basically one of the funniest damn shows I've ever <laughs> seen in my life. <laughs> it is, yeah. I've got to give it that. It is. It is. <laughs> There's um, something that's funny. Irish humor, I don't know. It's very close to show business humor, gallows humor, how to make fun of the situation you got and the work yeah. you've got to do. And it's very similar to show business mentality. The fact that my family's Irish and they're entertainers, it's very like, I mean, I love the sign that, that they would put on hotels and bars that would say, no dogs, actors, or Irish allowed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, when you had mentioned there um, <clears throat> just a few minutes ago about, you know, you, you've got fans that still mention the Fox and the Hound and different things like that. I, I'm, I don't know if you have the same opinion, but I feel like that there's something, and it, it pains me to say this, but I do feel like that when I look at, uh, you know, modern day filmmaking and just the whole experience, the movie going experience and the magic of movies. I can't help but feel like there's something lost from, you know, when I when I look when I look now at a movie like uh, Adventures in Babysitting or Don't Tell Mom, um, you know, even some of the late seventies, eighties horror. I can't help but feel like something's been lost. Um some of the magic maybe i'm not sure like is everything too commercialized too mainstream now some of these things just don't feel as um like i can go back and watch uh adventures in babysitting and it just feels so genuine so real so well magical i don't know i have a few theories on that and they go back to the tech technical they go back to the physical reality of how you shoot movies and how you distribute movies um, in the seventies, in the eighties and the nineties and the early two thousands, um, it was film capture until collateral, uh, the Michael Mann movie mm-hmm. starring Tom Cruise yeah. until collateral came out. No movie had shot, you know, with mostly digital capture. I think 80% of collateral was shot with digital capture. Um, uh, apocalypto was another big one. Uh, shot on digital and it looked great and uh, it, it, it uh, Apocalypto took on, on some of the challenges of digital as did Collateral they were having problems making it feel like film so after that they pushed past it most capture all of a sudden big budgets are doing it Star Wars famously they decided to capture George Lucas because I'm going to do all digital capture um, so that I can go right to projection with it and so here's where I think things changed my grandfather got to see it go from, first of all, got to see movies invented, um, got to see silent film. Then he got to see them become talkies. And then he got to see television. He got to see color, widescreen, surround sound, cable. He got to see home box office get launched. He passed. Um, and uh, I got to see it go from film to digital capture. Uh, and uh, uh, and distribution. So I got to see one pretty major revolution. He got to see several. Um, and I'll tell you that the digital is the one that's changed how actors work on the set more than anything. Right, okay. Uh, all of those other things, maybe the huge Panavision cameras were hard to deal with when they're shooting Ben-Hur. Technicolor cameras, you know, are notoriously huge and unwieldy. But uh, CinemaScope, of course, was three-camera system. Um, the, uh, there's an event when you're on the set and you have film in the camera, uh, you have to load it and you can't expose it. And you know, the, Mm -hmm. uh, there's reverence around the camp. Don't touch the camp. Don't look at the camera funny. 
you know, there's a department that takes care of that and operates it. And yeah. just, it's very, you know, of the big three sound picture and story, um, you know, actors are flesh props really, but the camera is huge. Um, sound, everyone ignores sound, but it's so freaking important. So here's to all the sound crews who continue to do great work despite, you know, crews that don't even deserve them. <laughs> um, so you would uh, get to work in the old days, you'd get to work and you get barely ready, but you'd run to set real quick so that they can set up for a big master shot. Mm -hmm. And you get there and nothing's done yet. And the director goes, here's the set. Here's the scene. Let's block it. Let's okay. I'd come in here. I'd probably run over there. I'd go, Ooh, it's good over here by the window for light. Great. Okay. We got a general blocking. You guys go to makeup and wardrobe. Fine. We run off to makeup and wardrobe. Meanwhile, they're lighting for the big, big master shot. Which, means that once you get that and you got the whole three page scene done in the master shot technically if a meteor came out of space you have finished your filming for that scene so no matter after that it's all butter you could go in for yeah. coverage and get some oh some close-ups oh now an insert on the thing anything else second we'll get another day so you get as much as you can until the producer goes you know fart mm -hmm. off get off the set we yeah, yeah. On another location yeah. So, and then if you, while you're filming, it's very like, all right, we're about to roll. Is everybody ready? Great. Roll sound. Sound speed, because sound is cheaper than film. So you roll sound first. So you've got some dead sound. And then roll camera. Oh, you're turning that thing bitch on, man. Beep. Little light comes on. You hear it. <sighs> Start, goes in, you know, inside the camera. Yeah. Some cameras don't have good sound baffling. Some have better. Some have dirty loud mags like this this one particular mag we know always makes noise so it's good for exterior shots of driving or scenery or whatever where you're not going to need the mic so then you, you shoot your scene and it's you know ah, it's a little rough it's close let's do one more you fix a technical issue you do it the actors should just be great all the time and that's 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 because there's always technical issues so once they get the technical issue figured out you better have nailed it because they're probably going to move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great, we got it. Two, three takes, you're done. Moving on into coverage, and that's also take a break because we got to relight for this angle. Take a break and, oh, roll out, reload. What is a reload? Uh, everyone take a break. Go take 10, have a smoke. They got to take the camera mag off, you know, mm -hmm. dark bag change it out, put a new camera mag on, get rolling, white balance. Okay, we're all good to go. Um, and, uh, you could shoot nine and a half pages is pretty ambitious, but you could do it parts of that four, five to 10 pages a day. Um, and, uh, shoots would last 90 days. I'd done a short one, right? 15 day shoot, maybe 16 day shoot, but the ski movie was 16 day shoot had 60 days of second unit for all the skiing sequences, which was a lot of the movie. So with digital comes along. All right, we're pretty much lit. Um, go ahead and get to make up a wardrobe. What? Oh, okay. See, so we can make up a wardrobe. Come on out. And they tell you, all right, you're going to stand there and walk in here. Oh, you just pre-blocked it. I have no choice in the matter, especially with TV. They're rolling too fast. They can't take time to listen to an actor's input. So you go stand and do what you're told to do. And, and uh, they, oh, um, there's no reload because it's infinite disk drive space. Yeah. They're just up. Oh, and there's no cutting. There's no take two or three. We're still rolling. Fix the word. They fix the wardrobe bit. You're sitting there. Uh huh. And the thing in the back, and they fix that. They fix like, yeah, still rolling. Okay, go whenever you're ready. What? We're just still running. Yeah, it's infinite. True. Who cares about the film? We're just rolling all the time. Hell, we were shooting rehearsal. You were what? Yeah, we were shooting rehearsal. You never do that with film because you're just wasting yeah, film. Yeah. It costs money. Digital, it's like, oh, delete that, delete that, reuse the drive. So um, there's no, there's less reverence for rolling mm -hmm. now. And then you get to distribution, which is great. Uh, you know what? We, yeah, we spent a little bit on that. Yeah, it's not great. Yeah, well, we got to strike prints, theatrical release. How many do we have to do? Uh, contractually, it says we got to do 1,200 prints. 1,200 prints of 35 millimeter blow ups at like three grand a print. Oh my God. Boom. You, you know, distribution is costly. Even on a stinker, you got to get it out. I think hiding out was maybe 800 theaters. The smallest they did was under the boardwalk, 60 theaters, all in California, along coastal beach community cities, 
you know, hit that market. And it was um, New World Pictures, which mm-hmm. was uh, Grindhouse, basically. It's Grindhouse stuff. So today they're shooting movies in much less time, except for the big special effects stuff. They're getting actors in for two or three weeks, shooting the whole dang picture, using available light. They have great, you know, yeah, we got 13 full stops on this uh, chip. And it's like, we don't need to light it. Well, one bounce card. Okay, your little indie drama is lit. You're rolling all the time. You capture everything all day. It's all you know made in the editing room. Um, and uh, for distribution, they go, we'll put it on a server. Nobody watches it. There's no cost because yeah. we're not pulling the file off the server and paying transport fees. Or There's a little cost to do duplicating now. We've reverse engineered how the internet should be, which is decentralized and many pathways. So if a node goes out, it just reroutes and can get across the country, across all these pathways. Now it's highly local central server files that just serve this area and this area and this area and this area. And and to update a file, it has to be beamed and updated at all the central servers and then like re licensed and uh, um, so the distribution now is also, um, you know, uh, yeah. Tomorrow War, really great sci-fi, but didn't have like a go-to-the-movie release. It had Amazon Prime, and we loved it. We watched it twice. I think I watched it that night. And uh, I was like, this really deserves to be seen in the theater. Um and until they get to Blu-ray and DVD and they know the market, how many they need to press so they don't have a loss or extra inventory, then they know because they know their market. And they already have a formula for how many people stream something to how many people will buy it on the Blu-ray with behind-the-scenes DVD features. And they already figured that out. Um, you know, studios have stated that minus the production, the actual distribution costs that – they make the same amount of profit on streaming as they do on DVD and all other stuff. So, um, and they're working on contracts right now. I is striking or maybe they're using strike authorization, which they got from 90% of their voting members. They're the grips and the electricians mm-hmm. and makeup and set directors, dressers and all the crew basically on, on a lot of professional TV and movies. And they're, uh, they're ready to walk. Because it's just dangerous. You can't work six day weeks, 18 hours a day, and get no sleep. You know, we have people die driving home from set. And that's, you know, they're trying to address that and then get paid more for these. This, <laughs> what they say is, this is experimental. This streaming thing is new. They've been saying about that for VHS and DVD for 20 years. It's yeah. still in the experimental <laughs> category. Yeah. I'm like, man, I've seen the numbers. That That is a good part of your revenue the tail Mm -hmm. end of something and the tail everything's changed and it changes all the time yeah and it's something (laughs) i i heard you tell the story about the whole uh you know house of cards and the whole netflix ai thing Mm -hmm. and recommendations Mm -hmm. which and i would consider myself like i i you know i'm pretty tech savvy and try to keep up on different things but i didn't realize that things got that uh in depth that the ai is that clever that there's that much like you said like they already know if something needs and to be Ann green Sarnoff, that, yeah it's uh, crazy and Sarnoff, the new um president at warner brothers the fourth woman to run a major hollywood studio um that's kind of pathetic considering hollywood's been around for 100 years mm-hmm. but uh she has employed and i think they employed it around the time she came on um an ai to read scripts, then you input elements. You go, here's the cast we're going to use, and here's the day we're going to, and what market we want to release it on. And it runs the numbers, and it says, move the date here, or recast that, or the story's weak, or, and it tells them how much they'll make as they slide around dates and everything. Oh, it's amazing. It's amazing. But that's smart because then you can get through some, you know, did you ever see the pickle? Mm. it is a guy is a studio director producer that's kind of on his outs you know he hasn't had a hit in a while and the studio needs a write-off they need a loss so they find the it's basically the producers but done with a movie script 
Um, so they find this movie called The Pickle. It's a giant space pickle that invades Earth and hovers. Right. Over. Okay. And um, so they set him up to direct it, and he goes at it knowing he's being set up. He goes at it with all enthusiasm. Um, the, uh, do the right thing. He owned the pizza shop. I think he's got a junior in his name. R- R- L- mm. Can't remember his name now. He's the star. Uh, and the pickle is great because like John Carter cost 300 million to make for Disney. And then they removed on Mars because they said the marketing department said, yeah, movies with Mars in the title don't do well. Now you don't even know it's a William Burroughs story. You're like, who the hell is John Carter? Of what? Yeah. And, so, and apparently it's great adventure movie um, that just got marketed and spent too much on it. And, you know, it's, it's amazing. I love flops. <laughs> yeah. I love flops when years later, like right now, there's a big thing of everyone should apart- apologize to Super Mario Brothers, the movie. <laughs> I, I've actually seen... Uh, that movie crop up again in the last like 12 months a lot of people seem to be talking about it again yep yep um it's one of those things i didn't see the new sonic with um no jim carrey but i i didn't see either of them but or i don't even know if the second one's out but i hear he saves the day for them and makes and also the audience when they first saw the first sonic teaser they went he looks horrible what are you doing oh my god and um they went ahead and they recomped some of the 3D shots and mm-hmm. bore them. They're like, here, we fixed it. And they went back and they fixed it. Yep. Which I love is that. Crazy. Do listen you, do listen you think, to your audience. <clears throat> uh, w- would you would you have considered yourself, um, or still maybe, a, a physical media guy or oh, somebody who pioneers so for that? That's the final connection into why there's maybe more love for stuff that came out in the eighties and nineties because you got a video cassette. You had to go to blockbuster and rent that thing. Yeah. And I have a fan that said that they would go to the video store and pretend to look around and then eventually just rent adventures and babysitting again. (laughs) I love that. I can see Um, that. So then they eventually buy it. And then it comes out on DVD or Blu-ray, so you buy it. And that physical having it, seeing it on the bookshelf, and it brings back the memories and the thing. There's something about the fit. Now we're streaming and an Apple TV and Netflixing, and nobody had a copy of Squid Game on their shelf. So 10 years from now, there's not going to be anything tangible to turn to and go, oh, I remember when Squid Game was the next Tiger King. Yeah. (laughs) And people will be like, what's Tiger King? Yeah, it's now that you now that you put it like that, it is. Uh, I guess everything is a lot more fleeting now. Where you know this week yes. it's it's all or this month it's all about Squid Games, and you know next month it's like what? Oh yeah, that show, that thing, that time. Whereas like I have so well, many, now- I could pull out a VHS right now. Um, I've got <coughs> Jaws, Candyman, Gremlins, uh, <coughs> Final Destination, all sitting right there, just to name a few. <laughs> And I could give you well, now a they call story. It content. Yeah, now like, they just call it content, and that is that tells you how they look at it. And they have a minimum shot thing for what is it? Netflix has a approved cameras list. If you're going to be a Netflix partner, there's a list of approved cinema cameras. As a filmmaker, I'm always looking at this list, and I don't have the budget for these hundred thousand dollar cameras. But there's some that are on there that come into the ten thousand dollar range, and you're like, "Oh, that's interesting." Um, I've also read that if it's a good project, they'll accept it no matter what format it was shot in. <laughs> right, I would believe so. Um, and iTunes is interesting because everything gets compressed so much. I think that they still sell stuff that's at five forty or seven twenty, mm-hmm. um, and that is, and it looks fine. It looks great on the TV, you know. Apple's good at all that video compression, and I've been Mac and Final Cut and compressor and and Handbrake. Everybody's got to remember to get their get their copy, free copy of Handbrake. Are you um Are you a fan of streaming, or does it kind of 
and maybe it doesn't, but just like lo- looking looking at some of your work and some of the things you've been involved in, these huge projects that a lot of people, like you said, somebody mentioned that they would go to Blockbuster and just kind of roam around the store yeah. with the intentions every time of picking up that movie. And like I feel like so many people have that, and you're definitely 100% correct in the sense of I could even, I've got an entire bookcase over there of DVDs, I've got a bookcase of VHS vinyls different things and I, each one i feel like i could pull it out and go and sometimes i do this like with my partner or if somebody's over and we're watching a movie and they'll be like oh you've got whatever and i'm like oh yeah let me tell you about this right i remember this time me and my granddad we done this thing or i remember on friday nights we used to do this and how do you feel like obviously streaming now kind of takes that away i i feel like nobody's really gonna say oh remember that time like 20 years ago and we used to netflix and chill and watch squid games are you a fan of the way things are going? Is there any way to to bring back that magic, or are we just past that now? When I was a kid growing up, when it was on, it was on. And if you missed it, you missed it. And I remember we got our, our first uh, home video system. It was for recording my TV appearances, so my mom could record yeah, you know, yeah. stuff for my clip tape. Um, but we, you know, use it occasionally to record stuff off the TV. Not too much. I had a friend who had Betamax and, uh, I remember going to his house and he'd have a rack of, you know, pirated. Mm -hmm. We have this thing called Z channel. There's a great documentary about Z channel. It was uncut versions of heaven's gate and like Donner Superman. And like the owner of Z channel would find filmmakers and go, can I get the original cut of Brazil? and show that on my channel mm-hmm. and they go short sure, blade runner, those kinds of things. And he'd license five movies a month and just play them all month. So you could really invest in watching a movie over and over again. And yeah. as the director intended, you know, away from studio interference. Um, so there, this rack of tapes. And I remember looking over and seeing Superman tape one, tape two, because it's Betamax and can only hold like an hour on each tape. Uh, but it's superior quality. It's not practical, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, what do couples split up and then go? Okay, you can have part one. I like part two better. <laughs> yeah. <I> mean, what <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the oh yeah, it was on when it was on. I remember a big one was Towering Inferno. It was a big deal. It had to have been 1979, and it was the first time on network television. And it was already you know those huge disaster movies had come to an end. You know, I think Airplane had already come out Mm -hmm. or was about to come out. So, like, you know, they'd already turned into Airport 79, Concord. Like, the real ones weren't really being made anymore. Earthquake and Roller roller Coaster was probably the end of it. And so Towering Inferno is going to be on, and that's just a huge deal. I remember Roots. You know, that's a multi-night, maybe multi-weekend thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Event television. And, um but you had to be there at that time. And that was very, a shared experience around yeah. the whole country. Um, I read stories of the mash finale with 111 million people watch that. It's the largest non sports ratings ever for a program. And they said in New York that at every commercial break, and you have this for a show, I think what's the Christmas holiday special? It's the sketch of the two people that it's like, Oh, we're going to have guests again. No, we're, it's like something that they always play. And they say that the ratings on that are skyrocket, but at the end of it, every time that in England, the water system has a problem because everyone puts their tea kettle on. And in the U (laughs) S And in the U.S., everyone goes to the bathroom after the end of MASH, and it clogged the New York City sewer system because uh, all you know millions of people did it They're at once. But once. that kind of shared thing, and then a water cooler moment, a Monday morning talking yeah. about Saturday Night Live or what was on this you know Sunday Disney movie. Um, you know, we do that now in a big, huge global scale. Look at talking about Netflix, you know, um, Squid Game and your awareness of Squid Game. My wife, we tried it. Ten minutes in, my wife goes, I, I can't watch this. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I, I know, but I know, you know, it's going to get better. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't have, you know, so many people obsessing over this. I can see where it's going to go. Oh, they did say something interesting. Did you watch the English dub 
or did you watch it with subtitles? Uh, both. So I had ah. it dubbed, but I had subtitles on, but they didn't match up. Because they said that the translations are different they are. and that it, he's a better father in the original language. That it, there's details in it that make him a better father or a richer uh, character. I found that fascinating. I, I, I did notice that uh, pretty quick into it. I was like, wait a sec, this... Wait now, the dubbing and the subtitles and everything all seem to be off. And I had only heard well, that like Akira, yesterday. Akira was the first time that it mattered, it made a difference, and that I understood it made a difference when watching foreign films, especially animated films, anime. Mm-hmm. Because the sound quality of all of the effects were different in the U.S. dub version. They weren't as cinematic and varied. They used the same bullet hit for every single one in the U.S. version, whereas the original version, it was just a more richer backing track underneath the dialogue. Yeah. My uh, friend got me to finally watch Akira by going, it's the Star Wars of animated movies. And I went, fine, I'll watch it. <laughs> <laughs> you were, uh, just when, we, when you had mentioned the video store and Blockbuster and things like that, there was a, uh, another movie you had a, a part in and it's one that always stuck out to me and I didn't even, I don't think I even realised it at the time till I seen it, which was uh, Soul Keeper. I don't know if you remember yeah. the artwork for that, but I so vividly remember seeing that artwork all the time and being like part kind of terrified, but also like super intrigued. And every time I would walk past, I would look at it and be like, hmm. I feel like it's got the men in black. um, uh, It's got such a comic beat to it. Because the director, the reason I'm in Soul Keeper is the director had directed Ivory Tower with Patrick Van Horn and Michael Ironside, Kari Wurr. Uh, And uh, he he goes, do you want to do this, you know, one day? a part on Soul Keeper. And I was like, heck yeah, let's do it. Mm-hmm. And it was shot on the same set they shot the Say, Say, Say video with Michael Jackson and Paul McCartney. <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> um, it's like, it's the same area where they shot the Don't Tell Mom, the Babysitter's Dead House. It's like 40 mm-hmm. miles outside of LA. It's kind of deserty canyon, like sleepy bedroom town. Um, Soul Keeper was, uh, it's funny, one of the leads in Soul Keeper is my cousin. And he was one of the small bit players in Under the Boardwalk. And the, there's these future scenes under the boardwalk and he's this other surfer. So I remember I'd worked with my cousin. It was like a second cousin, 19 mm-hmm. times removed. I remember I'd worked with him on Under the Boardwalk in 1987. And then I'm on the set of Soul Keeper and I'm like, oh, he's the lead now. I see. I see it flips. <laughs> Um, yeah, Soul Keeper was one of those movies again, and it's like even now, you know, all, however many years removed, it's still one of those things that every now and again, when I go looking for different things, there's and maybe it's just a thing. I don't know if you feel the same. Is it a thing with maybe the horror community or people who love that era of movies and that magic, but like they're, they're so diehard. And like, like you said, like the, we'll buy every edition. We'll buy all the pins, all the merchandise, all the, I need to know everything. I want to talk to everybody. I want to know stuff I never heard before. And it's like everybody kind of, and not in an egotistical way, but everyone wants to be the authority. I want to know every story, every nook, every cranny, give me a Blu-ray with, you know, eight hours of extras and every possible thing you can find. Do you think that's a thing that only applies to, I don't even want to say the horror community, but people who maybe came through those generations of movies? Like now I don't depends think they have an appreciation. One of the, depends on if you're the type of person that likes to peek behind the curtain and see the wizard is the same guy mm-hmm. that got the door at the beginning and the, yeah. the guy that runs the circus. and So if you're one of the people that likes to peek behind the curtain, because I the reason I read spoilers and I don't care about spoilers and I don't care about having things spoiled is because I've read the shining and goonies and gremlins 
And I'd read the, Stand By Me. I'd read the scripts before the movies came out. I'd mm-hmm. had some of the greatest movies of all time spoiled before, you know, I was just used to it. Um, and I also yeah. knew the structure. I, you know, do screenwriting. My parents are a are script doctors. They know all about saving the damn cat. Um, and uh, reference to Save the Cat, a great screenplay story. I, I go by screenwriting it is a book just called screenwriting and it is fucking great uh sorry i'm cursing no you're fine you're fine we're not pg here okay okay good to know oh good (laughs) i've been holding back this whole thing (laughs) so um i don't mind spoilers and then the um trailers i love we used to have teasers that were specially shot just for i don't know if you remember the gremlins teaser but there was two. There was one that would slowly push in on the box and then like the smoke and the light would come out. And one of them was letters, the mm-hmm. G and then the R and then that's on YouTube right now. But I didn't know that those were cutouts from other movies, titles, that those were specifically cut for just like office space is cut from um, fast food chain restaurants and corporate logos, the office space logo. Um I didn't know that about that. Anyway, I didn't know about that. But um, and hey, where were we? I got to, too much coffee. That's um, that's something I didn't know. Actually, just when you mentioned Gremlins as well, that's that's another one I remember. I had a, a, a really strange uh, fear of Gremlins for a long, long time until I was like 17. Like I literally couldn't sit through Gremlins 2. And I have, no, I have no real idea why. And it's the one specific scene where they have... Uh, Gizmo, he puts him in a drawer and leaves him there. Oh. And they... Not the uh, microwave, not the blender, but the drawer. Yeah, and I don't know what, and that like stuck in my head all the time when they kind well, of started... Well, it's bullying, to, it's abuse. You yeah. see these four or five bullies picking on the kid, throwing darts at them. I mean, you know, obviously, I mean, you know, Chris Columbus wrote Goon, uh, Gremlins and, and Goonies and young Sherlock Holmes and I think he wrote Reckless before Adventures of Babysitting. And um, he's so great at building character into story, into plot. So all three are always happening at the same time. I think that's one of the best ways to put it. And his darkness comes through in his movies. There's a darkness to Adventures yeah. in Babysitting. Overall, it all takes place at night. It's a very dark frame, and we have very bad language and dark themes. It's not mm-hmm. really that scary, but it's still serious enough to be taken by a teenager or a tween as I'm kind of sneaking in. We're kind of sneaking in on an adult movie. Like, the kids in this story are not in the kid's world. They're in an adult world, you know, but we can relate through the kids to the adult world. And so Chris, and he worked great with young actors. And th- I think that's why Harry Potter is obviously such a huge success. Yeah. He knew exactly what he was doing with those kids and um, worked his way up because he took adventures of babysitting. Cause he said, it's not space. It's not oceans. It's streets and houses and office buildings and, and freeways and cars. He goes, it's very doable. It's very, modest in production value meaning and we still had models and special mm-hmm. effects and all this stuff but if he's going to get his feet wet he's going to go as big as he can with realistic kind of you know what i, I like to always call them guard posts on the road mm-hmm. even if it snows sometimes they're tall enough that you can still see where the edge of the road is and um so i think that he kept everything modest for him in terms of a challenge technically and then look at harry potter and look yeah. at where he took the technology it's it's crazy because again i feel like it ties into that same era that all you guys were kind of involved in um you know you had uh, adventures of babysitting he had done home alone home alone 2 mrs doubtfire um, jingle all the way and they all have this again it's like that family movie that family fun Uh, i remember any old man yeah um yeah yeah, he well, yeah, he's a family man. I mean, he has a big family. He comes from a big family. Um, he's very uh, rooted in that, and I think he. And that was also I was spoiled on Avengers of Babysitting. It's still true in every shoot. You create a quick bond, a family with for the three months that you're shooting a movie. You have to. You're just night and day when you're awake. You're with these people. Yeah. <laughs> these people. 
<laughs> all working on the same goal. Um, and uh, so, yeah, he was a great, great leader for all that. Uh, and his influences were pretty much mine so that uh, he can shortcut direction. He could just, you know, he had us watch um, uh, After Hours with Griffin Dunn, directed by Scorsese. He goes, it takes place all in one night. He leaves his house. He goes on all these adventures, rarely going back to the same location mm -hmm. twice, and then runs off at work at the very end, just in time for the day. So the structure is in After Hours. And he had us watch Arsenic and Old Lace for comedic patter and physical comedy. And uh, we watched whichever Marx Brothers movie is A Day at the Races. No. Horse Feathers. One of the ones where they're uh, horse racing, the horse racing Marx Brothers one. Animal Crackers? I don't remember. And then uh, what was the other movie we watched? Um, I want to say there was another reference in there. But then he also, then he could say, you know, you know, like in this movie, do it like this. And that's a shortcut on the set. He doesn't have to give you a line reading. He can tell you what my, I was like, where's my Spielberg shot? He's like, what do you mean? I want, I want that dolly zoom and mm -hmm. pushes in. But he's like, fine. So we get, finally, we're shooting outside the Associate Center and they're like, I find Sarah's cape. And I'm like, Sarah's in trouble. And they're setting up the dolly track. And I'm mm -hmm. like, am I getting the Spielberg shot? He's like, yep, here it comes. You're getting your Spielberg shot. <laughs> it's it's just, even to hear you tell some of them stories, there's, there's um, I, I can't help but feel like there's definitely a magic there that's, I don't want to be really down and out and say that it's completely lost or whatever, but even something like, uh, I, I go to, um, to Orlando a lot and to Universal Studios and different things like that. And like they have these big amazing four D like Transformers and um King Kong and all these things. And I find myself time and time again going back to the only original Universal ride that's still there, E. T. And as soon as I walk in, it has the really shitty like VHS style uh, tape of Steven Spielberg talking about E.T. and it's just really cheesy and kind of campy and like everything smells old and it's just like a, some of the animatronics are all fucked up and old looking and some of them don't work and I'm like I want to ride this a million times and I don't really care about Transformers and it's 4D and it's got all this crazy explosions it's uh, it, it's crazy that that's still has pet work. We have um, replaced uh, E.T. with uh, The Mummy. And then I think they took, I don't know what the status is of that building here at Universal in L.A., but uh, The Mummy was a great ride. But They still have that I in Orlando, that. sorry. Yeah, that's amazing. I miss that E.T. ride out here. Yeah. I worked at Universal, too. I worked shipping and receiving at Disney. I worked admissions and like customer, I don't know, I don't know how you call it. I was in the admissions department at Universal Front Gate, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, tour guide at Sony Studios. I love working on movie lots. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to ask, is is movies your life? Is it, is it always something that you wanted to be involved in? And now, you know, even still to this day, in any capacity, do you just enjoy being around the of course, business? Of course. My great grandparents were in vaudeville my grandfather did silent film and television yep uh my mom is a comedian and a writer and i uh am an actor and uh, uh um, love to i've directed and written and produced and um love and worked every job on a set and in theater every job on stage that you could work from opening the curtain to running the lights to the sound to building the sets to, you know, um, and I'd heard, it might've been Chris. He said he studied ballet, contemporary art, art history, music, sculpture, and, uh, uh, and he goes, that's because movies are combining all of that you've got a frame and you've got composition, you've got, yep. you know, uh, music and, and acting share a lot of the same things, the way that they tell a story, uh, the structure of a song, the structure of a movie. Um, the, uh, we, they share one terminology beat in a script. You will say beat 
to like kind of wait a moment for a character. And in music, you have a beat, you have a rest. Um, and so combining all of those things into uh, one medium that has them all, that sound, that, 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 uh, the visual, um, which can ruin a good book. You know, everyone reads a book and they're like, this is how I see the movie. And yeah. then I saw, um, um, what's the Oprah Winfrey one? Uh, um, w- uh, Wind in the Door, Swiftly Tilting Planet, um, the Madeline Alengel books, uh, uh, Wrinkle in Time. So I watch A Wrinkle in Time and it doesn't match up to what my little nine-year-old imagined when I read A Wrinkle in Time. And I was pissed at Mm -hmm. Oprah Winfrey. I'm like, how dare you? If you're going to show it, I don't know. And that's why it's hard to do um, um, what's my favorite kind of horror? Well, body modification horror. But I also, also really love Lovecraftian horror and cosmic horror. Mm-hmm. Absolutely love it. I love Mouth of Madness. Um, that's a great, yeah, one of John Carpenter's great, yeah, sneaking in. Doesn't get enough love. Mouth of Madness in on us. Anything that um, lets you stand uh, at the precipice of the abyss and go, oh my God. Mm-hmm. Um, I love Lovecraft, and Lovecraft is unfilmable. And so anything that gets close to it or, you know, or, or suggests it, I hear that there is some Lovecraft stuff being worked on. I was faked out by Lovecraft country. Um, <laughs> can't internalize Lovecraftian. It's entirely external. Uh, <laughs> they're trying to internalize it with U S history, race relations. Well, I guess because Lovecraft was incredibly racist. Maybe. I'm uh, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> is, is that funny? A- my favorite authors were George Orwell, H.G. Wells, Bradbury, Stephen King, Lovecraft. Did I lose you? No, we're back. We're good. Yeah, I was just going to ask you. Had mentioned about uh, you know you've worked basically every job you can work in in the movie business in a sense and in theater is that something that you would advise all aspiring actors creators whether it be writers directors should you try and just get yourself in there and do anything and everything yeah i think that a pa is a great job production assistant because you'll be assisting a lot of different departments um and you'll just learn general i saw a, a guy and this is on the uh, New World Entertainment uh, Project, Roger Corman's company. Um, mm-hmm. He went on one picture, he went from uh, a PA, basically a glorified gopher. Uh, and while he's on that set, he wrote a script. And the thing about this production company, PM Entertainment, they um, have a mansion they shoot at that's always the bad guy's mansion. They have a red convertible Cadillac that's always the hero's car or the sidekick's car. They have certain locate a hospital. They should have certain ones that they mm-hmm. always just put in their scripts because they know how to get the permits. They know, you know, they got the rent slow and all that other stuff. So he writes a script that fits their kind of format and they pr- produce it. It's the next one that they make. It goes really well. The very next picture he's directing so he went from a wow. production assistant the lowest on the rung to a writer which is slightly lower than production. no to a writer and then he's directing by the third picture now granted this is with a very um nuts and bolts skeleton crew production company that mm-hmm. really only has you know 17 people on the set rather than 117 that's crazy to go from but, but you think the key is to just be in the industry in any capacity and, and get all the knowledge you can? Sure. Uh, Hollywood pretends it's this big full balloon with this smooth, impenetrable surface. BS. It is this huge, God knows, nobody knows what they're doing. There's plenty of holes. you got to find a way to be the puzzle piece they need right now. Be the, yeah, I see you guys have a problem. I have to, I'm it. I'm the answer to all of that stuff. Have no ego. Be total team player. Not all ideas are great, but spit them out. They could be turned into a great idea by somebody else. Be sharing, be caring, look out for everybody. You'll totally lose your head as soon as you get any success. Be prepared for that. Don't mess up the second time you get success. But you'll 
Trust me, you always fuck it up the first time. So the second time you go, oh, I remember all those mistakes. If you repeat them a second time, then you're just a douchebag. And 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 live with that, absorb it, make it your brand. Yeah, that was something I was going to ask about, um, I, I guess, the potential pitfalls of of fame and of being in these huge projects and stuff. How did you deal with that over, like you've had a long career so far. How do you deal with not you know you see these people and unfortunately they just slip into a different life and things just completely just completely fall apart i guess um you uh there's nothing you can do to guarantee success in the business but there is something you can do to guarantee failure in the business quit give up. So I've just held on like a pit bull terrier <laughs> through whatever. I just always maintained union status, Green Actors Guild, American Federation of Television and Radio Artists. And my, I've always had tried to have representation and it's sometimes very hard to have an agent if you don't have fresh work or what have you. Mm-hmm. Can't write off of 30 year old movies forever. It's nice. It could get me in the door somewhere or when a filmmaker is a fan and goes, Hey, I love him. Let's put him in a you know little part. Um, and uh, I'll answer the phone. This is Keith. I'll do it because if it's bad, no one sees it. It doesn't hurt you. If it's good, then it's great. You know, it's so just say yes. You'll learn something on every project, or you'll work with people that are you know find it find friends on projects that are terrible projects, but you find people that you get along with and are in your tribe, and you wind up working with them on something else. How do you have any go to or any? I guess one tip or something you could advise people for. And I feel like it's probably more prevalent now, or maybe it's just brought, been brought to the surface, uh, you know, through social media and different things. Uh, I feel like a lot of people try things and maybe it is really their dream. And, you know, they get beaten down and beaten down and just kind of think, you know what, fuck this. It's obviously, I, I just, I guess I'm just, you know, I'm not, I'm not good enough at this or I'm not, it's too, it's too tough. I've got to work a job or I've got a wife and kids. Do you have any advice for somebody on just, like you said, uh, I like the way you explained that there about like, you just, you just grabbing onto it like a pit bull and it's just, you know, I'm not, I'm not letting go of this. So you've got to bring me for the ride. Well, um, this is something that you have to be, uh, dragged from. So if you clinging on and, you know, you got all these forces kind of dragging you from it, then um, if you can be dragged from it, then I guess it wasn't really important at all. Yeah. Uh, it is, a, don't, you know, double down. I mean, the room has, you know, amazing fan following, but not for the reason why the filmmaker made the room. Um, and does that translate into, the filmmaker who made the room into him working now. No, Mm -hmm. just, you know, keep in mind what might pay off later. Um, Don't put somehow millions of dollars into something that's, you know, nothing Start small. You already have what you need. I see that people have the internet and cameras on their phones. And these cameras are pretty damn amazing. Um, Go ahead and, and shoot a scene a short, an idea, a speech, a podcast. I think create, create, make something. Don't steal music. Don't steal images. Don't, you know, be, be nice. Be create. Yeah. Um, I think that's really the thing. I, you know, I've been reading a lot of stuff lately that um, talent is an obstacle to productivity uh, because you want to make it as good as you can and you don't start until you have everything in it. And they're like, no, make with what you have. Like, like, I had said about earlier with Nolan, the, well, the movie that came out in theaters that you were under the gun to make, and this is what you had. You know, years later, there's now fans and money and more budget to go tweak it a little bit. No, no, no. Mm-hmm. The one that you had a hand in on deadline, join a 48-hour film festival. Those are incredibly challenging. And um, my for me, I, I went and I started small on workflow. So get your equipment, get your thing, your editing, do a workflow of something all the way down to how you would deliver it to iTunes or how you deliver it as a, um, to theaters and, you know, theaters, a lot of projectors now these days just can play, you know, um, iTunes, you know, can play MP4s or whatever. So you don't even have to go through making a 
the whole package or whatever those are called. Um, so uh, do your workflow beginning to end something with music and titles and a story or something like that, create it. And then that they go, great. That sucked. Throw it out. After 20 of those, then you'll start to have control over your thing. And, and it's funny. You may be the seventh one is a hit. People love it. And it's viral. I mean, who don't worry about, uh, Oh, and I also learned a great thing about, um, criticism years ago my mm. grandfather he never really took good critic good good positive like oh you're great i love you He'd be like, oh, okay great thanks we were like how come you're not excited he goes because then there's critics that say you suck or your has been or whatever and you, you know if you listen to the good then you got to listen to the bad so don't listen to any of your critics positive or negative i'm like that's interesting and i know there are a lot of big stars that don't even have social media accounts they do their thing they don't even watch their own work they do their work. Confidence is another big thing. Confident is, and in a great interview question, if they ever say, well, what's your fatal flaw or what is it, you know, the thing that you could work on or what is the negative thing or whatever. There's and people always come up with bullshit ones like I'm an overworker or I always, yeah. they always come up with some answer <laughs> yeah. that sounds like a positive. Yeah. My brother, my brother-in-law, he goes, the answer to this question in a job interview is if they go, well, what's your flaw? What is, you know, you go, well, I don't know everything, but I'm willing to learn, you know, that just stand there and go, I am capable. I am good. And I'm confident. And that'll get you further than anything. Um, yeah. And uh, could trust me, it's not a film degree. No one slaps up a four year film degree from USC on the wall and that's it. I've made it. Now you've made some good connections at that particular school. Yes. Yes, and you have a better chance than most. Maybe, you know, New York Film School or something like that. They're, they're, but um, the, it is uh, the Kevin Smiths and the um, Linkletters, Richard Linkletter. Uh, uh, it is the uh, Robert Shea who found Freddie and yeah. uh, found uh, Jackie Chan. Bob Shea, who runs New Line Cinema, mm-hmm. who sold to Warner Brothers for $60 million, uh, personal money of $60 million. Um, he uh, came back from Con Film Festival with Jackie Chan on his shoulders, going, I have found the next Bruce Lee, and introduced him to American film audiences, recut some foreign release, dubbed it, and then finally got new money to make new productions with Jackie Chan. Um, he was a distributor, and he made his money originally distributing Reefer Madness because it had gone, the copyright wasn't valid. So he sold 16 millimeter prints to college universities for night movie madness thingies, made enough money to go to con film festival and start buying things and distributing them. Um, there's a lot of ways in what really fascinates you. Do you want an editor? Do you want to be a color timer? Do you want, do you want to do makeup or wardrobe? You know, a lot of people want to be a star and, and have it overnight. I'll tell you about this with the spouse and the job and the thing and this, it only gets worse the more success you have. There's more conflict between those things. There's more issues over money. There's more, Kevin Smith, as soon as you make a certain amount of money, boom, the lawsuits start happening. Mm -hmm. So my family always said, well, you you wanna stay warm forever. You don't wanna get hot, because once you're hot, you can cool off. So you just stay warm forever. You don't want that, can't go to, you know, the supermarket kind of fame. And that's interesting. That's for a career lifelong thingy. And I, that ever since I was eight and I saw the kid and I went, Oh, but movies, movies different than TV. Okay. Got it. I want to do movies. And I auditioned for every single movie you could as a kid actor until finally breaking with adventures of babysitting, which was perfect for me that I'm Brad. Yeah. Uh, uh so thank you to Chris Columbus and mm-hmm. to uh, Jane and Janet. Thank you for casting me and babysitting. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, okay. A couple of final questions um, before I let you go. Do you have a favorite out of some of the bigger slashers, whether it be Freddie, Jason, Michael, Letterface, Pinhead? Is there anyone that sticks out to you as a favorite? Oh, Leatherface is great. I got to meet John Duggan, who played Grandpa. And nice. uh, we met at an autograph convention. He's a great soul. And he told me all the stories you wanted to hear about 
the dinner scene. And um, I also got to work with Daniel Pearl, who was the cinematographer on Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He was, because he did Texas Chainsaw Massacre, he got work in music videos later because they don't have budgets and they need a really good look and he had the equipment. And because of music videos, he's worked with Bob Giraldi who was the one that set Michael Jackson's hair on fire in the, in the uh, Pepsi commercial. Well, he didn't set his hair on fire, but he was the one that got sued. He, Daniel Pearl wound up being the director of photography for Hiding Out with John Cryer. Mm-hmm. The same cameraman that shot Texas Chainsaw Massacre shot Hiding Out with John Cryer. I didn't know this at the time. I would have been all over him with questions. But there's a great recent article on Daniel Pearl that you could search, go Daniel Pearl and like news recent or whatever. And, um, Fante tells the whole story about, of his career as a cinematographer mm-hmm. through the industry. Yeah. I actually, um, I actually uh, had a chat with him recently. <laughs> uh, really? Yeah. Yeah. He's super interesting guy. He's so, I didn't, I didn't even realize till I, till I was speaking to him. And obviously I, you know, I do some research and I already know, uh, like I'm already a fan of, people if you know what i mean which is part of the the whole concept for this show it's like you know who would i want to talk to who do i want to hear about so it's kind of i guess it's a self-serving thing in a way um and then to be able to bring that to other people because i know what that content does for me and you know it just it it kind of reminds me of those happy times and it's it's something that i can do to take myself out of and i think it's really helped during the pandemic and stuff uh, and so many people have reached out to me and said like you know listening to all these different people it's just kind of been able to take my mind away from what's actually going on in the world right now um but yeah i didn't realize how uh, how expansive his career was it's uh crazy sure sure um my favorite horror icon though is bruce the shark from jaws uh and here's why because I think the Jaws has been labeled horror or yeah. adventure mm-hmm. horror or action or something, but it's pretty horrific. Yep. Gruesome. Um, it's certainly a great predator, a great thing out there trying to get mm-hmm. you while you're isolated in a small boat at night. He ate the lights. What do you mean he ate the lights? Um, it's a horror movie. It is, you know, all of our great base fears are out there drowning, eaten alive by a monster predator, teeth uh, drowning. Uh, did I say drowning twice? Uh, yeah, well, it uh, deserves it. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> so Jaws for me. And what's great is, you know, all the other horror icons had their legend expanded. You know, first with Freddy, it was denuded with number two. But then number three, Freddy made a quick comeback. And by four, you had a masterpiece. I think, you know, Dream Warriors and, you know, the great films. Um, Jason. By the second one, he'd started to form by 3D. Now we got Jason. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Uh, He kind of got better and richer over time. Chucky. My God, if Bride of Chucky isn't the only one you need. If you could throw all of the Chucky men and only pick one, I think Bride of Chucky is great. So thank you. But Jaws, there's no worthy predecessor or successor. Jaws 2 stinks. Jaws 3 stinker. Jaws 4. No, nothing really matches it you know um crawl was close i like crawl mm-hmm. uh but there wasn't a singular monster it was a couple of them um jaws the shark in jaws a doll's eyes black uh yeah the shark in jaws i i guess same question in a way if you could be in uh, any particular existing horror franchise or whatever, is there something that you'd love to just be on set for or have been involved with? The next Hostel. <laughs> no, really, because Hostel was the first one of the new gore porns that reminded me of Tom Savini's effects in Friday the 13th. The... Uh, texture the weight of the latex props that there's a moment in a hostel where he sneaks onto the body cart yeah and it's just yeah. all stacked arms and legs and pieces and i went savini that's so like it's just right there and cutting the achilles tendon and um 
that pet cemetery moment uh that uh it's funny we um somebody gets their head cut off and we're like oh cool kill but somebody gets their cuticle slightly hurt and we're like ah yeah, yeah. did That's you ever true. see takashi Mike's imprint yeah that okay so Okay, that, is that the most horrifying yeah. thing you've ever seen? I, and I have to Thank say, you. yeah, Thank you. I have to it, say, it and there's so many people online. I had to turn away. I was like, nope. There's so many people online, and I don't, I don't do like I, I enjoy. I actually Hostel and even Hostel Two are like some of my favorite movies. Like, um, guilty, not guilty pleasures, uh, comfort movies to watch, which is crazy in a way, but uh, imprint. Oh, and so many people, by the way, share that. I seen a thread on Reddit a couple of months back and there was hundreds of people that were like, this fucked me up. I, I actually enjoy gore, but I can't I can't look at it. Even now, I've seen it multiple times and every time I still like, ugh. Uh, yeah, the that's only one, one I have to see is a uh, Serbian film. And um, then I think I've covered what most people Nearly have said are the most difficult to watch. Oh, I refuse to watch Schultz Gets the Blues because I hear too many artists kill themselves after watching it. <laughs> yeah, let's leave that out. <laughs> don't don't even be tempted. Apparently it's <laughs> such a depressing movie that famous people have killed themselves after watching it. <laughs> is there um is there do you have a, a favorite memory? so far in your career is there something that like you always look back on more fondly than everything else <coughs> probably a difficult question wow uh yeah difficult question indeed um i i i, I don't know yeah I mean, that's yeah one of my first jobs was a viewmaster viewer commercial with henry fonda what? Hello? You know, cousins with Lloyd Bridges. Or, and Ted Danson was even an afterthought. Lloyd Bridges. for I'm doing a scene with Lloyd Bridges. I, You know, the moments where I got to work with people that I thought were legendary and people that other people thought were legendary, like I did a Mork and Mindy with uh, Jonathan Winters and, and Robin mm -hmm. Williams. Or a Laverne and Shirley with Penny Williams and uh, Penny Marshall and Cindy Williams and Lenny and Squiggy. Uh, um, Knight Rider. I, you know what? Knight Rider is a good one because I got to ride in kit, play with, you know, Michael Knight and David Hasselhoff and run around uh, um, Clock Tower Square, which is the set we shot at at Universal Studios. So Knight Rider's perfect. We'll go Knight Rider. That's still one of my favorite shows. <laughs> my God, I have so many fond memories of so many episodes of that show. Um, Okay, I guess... Two final things. Uh, the future. What does the future look like for you? What would you like to do? And is there anything we can expect to see from you soon? Sure. Uh, I have uh, another film in the can, uh, Wrong Reasons, directed by Josh Rauch. He directed um, um, Magnum Dopus, which is the behind-the-scenes making of Jane and Silent Bob reboot. And if you, when you watch Magnum Dopus, you'll go, this is really beautifully shot. And, uh, you know, you go, I wonder whatever camera they shot this with, I wonder if you could make a feature with it. Well, so did Josh. And so he made a feature with the damn thing. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it's also the, uh, you got to watch Magnum Dopus. It's on Amazon Prime um, free, or if you're a member. And it um, has no interjected conflict, no fake, it just shows you how they made the movie. Mm -hmm. And, and at the end, you go, D I guess we didn't need that kind of fake drama that they always put into the behind the scenes, right? No, it's like shows you the kind of love, the Kevin Smith kind of like tribe thing. Um, and uh, what else did I put in the can? The uh, web series, another web series. And I just got offered a movie um, that'll shoot next June, July, I think. A little small part, but good money. And uh, I have an episodic TV show coming out that i can't talk about for non-disclosure agreements but it'll be out in a few weeks nice yeah i i know um i know josh rouse uh i had first come oh. across him he had done um he had done oh it's another kevin smith movie uh the making of tusk have you seen tusk yes no 
Uh, I've not seen Tusk. Yeah, he. I, I'm not sure if he uh, editor possibly on on that. Uh, I think he made that. Yeah. Yeah, because I like, I, and it's like you said earlier. I'm one of those people who wants to peek behind the curtain of everything. If I like something. Then I've got to go do a deep dive and I watch every YouTube video and I want to know everyone's opinion and everybody who was involved and somebody's brother's uncle's sister that has a story. Um, then you watched Madness and the Method, I'm sure. I'm Jamie is his picture. I'm uh, I'm just one of those people and I think I always will be. Um, I'm yeah. just trying to clutch on to that magic that I felt years ago uh, that I feel like is gone now. Um, okay, so for everybody listening... Uh, all the links to everything will be down below. Um, all of Keith's social media's appearances, anything like that, will be in the description wherever you're listening to the podcast. So I have one final question, sir. Uh, and I'll, I'm going to tailor it a little bit from what I normally ask. Um, and that would be, what, why film, why, why movies, and, and what, does it, what does it mean to you? Uh, what was the beginning of the question? Why why film or why the movie industry and what what does what does it mean to you? Oh, um <laughs> Did you do you watch Ted Lasso? No. They have a character that's uh, football is life. <laughs> and uh so movies have been life I think I was born into and raised in a showbiz family mm-hmm. um and worked my way up. Uh love it. Um, have gone as you know had a nice done this way and I've also done this way and tried everything that you can yep. and love it I love you never know what you're doing tomorrow <laughs> in this business <laughs> uh, I, I mean I have to get off this interview and literally just check my email and just see what what scene am I shooting tonight to audition for something or what you know what job did I book when am I traveling somewhere or whatever I literally don't know from hour to hour what I'm doing in a week or two weeks or two months or three months. And um, I've always loved that. I love living out of a trunk. Um, I love hotels and traveling uh, and, you know, the traveling airplane suck, but, um, but I love going to, uh, you know, me and my wife, we wanted to go to all 50 States and we've already hit what, like 38 States. We've done pretty damn good. That's good. There's a few States that people that even live in them will go, you don't want to, come nah, not not here uh and uh it is uh something that i think that uh for, oh, my grandfather had a great comeback with uh adam's family so you know he's five years old when he does the kid with charlie chaplin he's 50 years old when he plays uncle fester on the adam's family and that was really you know there's whole generations that only know him from the adam's family work so he cleaned the slate and had a great comeback and and America, the U.S., we love comeback stories. and We love second chances and redemption. And mm-hmm. unfortunately, I never fucked up and had a high-speed pursuit or arrest or any, you know, scandal. So people always go, what happened? And I go, I don't know. I don't know what happened. I, you know, <laughs> I'm still doing it. Uh, yeah. You, you know, let me know when I'm a hit again. Um, and it, it, that's the pleasure of doing it and working on a set far outweighs the box office success. And, you know, I'm very aware of what makes quality product and what can make money. Um, and that's not my determining factor on doing a project because as an artist, you may be great with oils and, you know, but somebody goes here quick. Can you do a watercolor sketch? I don't paint with watercolors. How bitchy is that? So yeah, you pick up the watercolors. You need to do your work with watercolors if you have to. Yeah. That makes but yeah, sense. I love it. That makes um, sense. Me and my wife started a YouTube channel, uh, Keith and Pinky's Hollywood Tales. She loves to get selfies with celebrities, thousands of uh, celebrities. And um, we show a little, little bit of both of our lives from this side of the, the rope to that side of the rope. And like, I'm a fan of people and I've always been. That's why my best moments in film, I think, are working with other great people. And uh, I've learned to see it from her point of view, kind of being mm-hmm. a kid in a video store reading the back of the box to standing and watching them walk by you on the red carpet. And um, I've tried to drag her onto sets when I can. And uh, like she was on the set for Jane Silent Bob Reboot. And I want to share with her that 
you know, side of it too. And then we also got, we don't make a lot of money. We're not rich by any means, but I do get residuals from the films and stuff, but we also travel a lot because of the autograph conventions and, and sometimes for filming for me. And, uh, um, we're like, when we got married, we're like, Hey, can we just do this for the rest of our lives? Just kind of yeah. travel and meet people and kind of celebrate. Yeah. It's celebrating me. But whenever we go to an autograph convention, there's always like a cast of 90210 or the, you know, a reunion from evil dead or it's great. And you just, you know, that I fanboy out all over again. Yeah. You get to immerse yourself in what you love. I, I love that. I love when, and I feel like people can see and hear true, uh, whether somebody does something because it's, you know, I want to be famous or I want to be this or I want to be that or somebody just genuinely. I think for the for the last, it's been nearly two hours chatting with you and I think for the entire time, I think people will be able to hear the the passion and the enthusiasm still ring true for you. It's not just like a cash in or like a, oh yeah, I'm that guy. Woo, let's pretend to be that guy. Yeah, well, uh, also don't forget, I am a very good actor, so... <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. And because there's no, um, what's the note? If you want to, if you, you want to hear an actor complain, give them work. Um, <laughs> it, you know, I love it. I'm appreciative. I'm very grateful. Uh, probably heard, uh, we saw him at a book signing. He's a great speaker. Very smart. Very funny. Amazing. Very smart. Pre- being present is half the battle in Hollywood. Just listen, pay attention, follow what's going on. Like I said, it's been a it's been a pleasure and an honor. It's actually kind of surreal for me when I get, I, I tend to to babble and I, sometimes I have to pull myself back a bit. Um, it's kind of surreal to be honest. Uh, you know, growing up on on your work and being such a fan even now, and you know, to to talk to somebody like you and just see that you still have that passion and that desire is a. Uh, even just from us talking, I get that like nostalgic, like magic feeling. I'm like, ah, oh, this is exactly, it's like a time capsule. <laughs> um, so it's been a pleasure. Like I said, all the, all the links will be down below. Um, and I just pulled up your YouTube channel as well. So I'm going to link that as well in the description. Um, so everybody who's listening, go and check out the YouTube channel and make sure to subscribe to it. Um, hopefully we can do this again in the future. Um, Maybe if you've got some more stuff coming up. Oh, I love uh, it. Your research was, yeah, your research was fantastic. I appreciate that you've listened to some of the other lengthy podcasts, especially on the, um, the technicality, the technical stuff and the economics mm -hmm. of Hollywood, the politics of Hollywood. That always fascinates me. Um, there are five or six groups in Hollywood studios, basically. And like, they'll follow each other up, up, studio head leaves it goes to another studio he's taking those big stars and he's developed relationships with and the cameraman and everybody with them you know yeah and it's funny to see the chess pieces move around from day to day the general public you know they're not affected that much yeah you know i'd I like that you're you're asking questions about how streaming is affecting the quality of movies or the movie going experience or the way that fans you know watch and enjoy them um, and or allowed to, we're no longer buying and buying a license that can be revocable. Yeah. Um, but the funniest thing they did with Kindle books is one day they announced that copies of 1984 were sold without the proper licensing with the family or George Orwell's estate. So they deleted copies of 1984 off of people's Kindle readers. Wow even after they'd already downloaded it, they deleted it from their device, reached in and sucked that thing out. Wrong title to prove a point with. <laughs> yeah, I know. But that's bizarre. So, you know, it's hard to find certain movies right now. Mm -hmm. Like you go try to stream dogma by Kevin Smith. Good luck with that. So that's a whole yeah. generation of people that aren't exposed to it. Period. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point actually. And I and I have found that where and obviously maybe being into the things I'm into, 
you know, I'm looking for these obscure 70s, 80s, 90s movies or obscure TV movies or horror movies. But then I just find that they, they just don't, like, the internet is this great, almighty thing, but then it just doesn't seem to exist. And I'm like, hmm, that's really weird and really frustrating. And why did I, where did my copy of that movie go and now I can't find it? And yeah, it's a, it's a really bizarre well, thing. Or they pulled it and they've changed it and they've, uh, change dialogue or they yeah. edited something out or they, they've did, done CGI to remove a brand name or a country's flag. Um, and then you don't know. I mean, I don't know which copy of ET I'm watching until I see some bad CGI. And then I'm like, Oh, okay. This is the revised copy. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, that's okay because I think it's interesting that I am talking about big filmmakers that decide to make changes later or big instances that were publicized with studio interference where they took over a cut from a director. Um, but that, that should, there, sh there could be and should be more of that because that itself is part of the process in filmmaking. So maybe we do get um, more and more instances of um, updating a movie or, uh, a director revisiting it because a new technique comes out and he goes, Oh, I can finally do this. Mm -hmm. You know, we, Oh, you got a, an actual 4k print, 8k print from a 35 millimeter untouched, never released. I can finally do that punch in and close up that I never had in the original. Now it's scanned high enough. I can actually do that one shot that would make people cry. It's like Spielberg reshooting the scene in the boat with um, Ben's head coming out of the thingy and then he's like, I can get one more scare out of the audience. Let me reshoot mm -hmm. this. They're like, no. And he goes, I'll find, I'll pay for it myself. And in Verna Fields pool, he shot Ben Gardner's head coming out of the audience. So there'll be more instances of Ben Gardner's head after the movie has been released. They go, Oh, yeah. we're seeing what's resonating with the audience. Let's cut out the B storyline. They don't even like that. Let's more on this. Do we have any unused dailies on? Okay. Let's add, you know, it could be, part of you know how we have bandersnatch mm -hmm. you can change the movie you're watching yeah, yeah. well i think slowly as societal norms change we go in and it's now we don't fuck with the lords of hell or fuck with the babysitter we don't fool with the babysitter because we want more people to see the movie you know you could <laughs> see what i did there yeah yeah that's that that was something actually uh uh, and not to get in, draw you into another big, huge conversation. It was actually something I was going to bring up earlier. And you had mentioned, obviously, um, you know, your grandfather was in, in the original Adams Family and stuff. And I had just recently rewatched um, the 90s Adams Family and Adams Family Values with my seven year old. And he absolutely loved them. But I can remember sitting there and going, you know, I've watched these movies so many times over the years and I never really zoned in as much as I did sitting with him and I was like how did they get away with some of the stuff in this movie like I don't know why Adam's Family was just one of, it's just one of probably thousands of movies where like you know at the time that was a kids rebranding of the whole Adam's Family thing and it's like I don't think you would get away with any of the stuff that was in that right now like currently we have the new Adam's Family 2 the animated one that's out this week and like, look, yeah. it's it's cool and it's fun and whatever. But if you compare it to what what we were giving kids back in the nineties, even it's like worlds apart. Are you familiar with the Hayes Code? The Hayes Office in the thirties um, film had uh, been telling wild tales of debauchery, and so a self police thing. And this was in van the Hayes Code, and uh, you could not show depravity. You could show homosexuality. Show a corrupt. There were all these rules, and film noir was heavily affected because it was all about drunk and harlots and robbery, murders, and criminals and corrupt police. So um, what's interesting is after the code was applied, um, filmmakers had to get very creative in suggesting mm -hmm. this is a, uh, a gay character or suggesting that somebody might be corrupt. And you see the inventiveness and creativeness of getting around the code is what it was called, getting around the code. 
So as long as you don't show something, you could allude to it. Well, I think that's a great example of Barry Sonnenfeld being told, deliver a PG movie on a subject matter that's heavily subversive. Hold on. I got to decline. So I telemarked her calling. So the Adams family were subversive. The original show was subversive and the original Charles Adams comics and then, um, and, uh, the New Yorker were subversive. Um, meaning they, you know, poke at the, the it's kind of really they think there was hammer horror, a Frankenstein, a Dracula, a werewolf. Um, and, uh, so that was, had higher ratings and in family and monsters were released at the same time within mm-hmm. a week of each other. Yeah. And they were canceled within a week of each other. And they both ran for two years, but the monsters had higher ratings. Um, because a lot of the stuff in Adam's family goes right over your head. And, um, and depending on where you are age wise, you pick up more in the show as an adult yeah. watching the show. I go, I can't believe they got away with that in, <laughs> in 1960s television. That's unbelievable that they, you know, did yeah. that. So you have movies. Now you have directors being handed a code. You got to make a PG 13. You got to, I'm sorry. And he's like, I'm doing a movie on the beheader. How do you want me to make that hmm. PG 13? They're like, figure it out. And so they're finding really interesting ways of going about that. One of them is it's always drones or aliens or robots. It's never an army of humans or humanoids that you're battling anymore. Now they've kind of changed it so that in movies it's all like, I think men in black um, three, no men in black international is a good example Mm -hmm. of changing it to the horde. And so that now you can have the same battle with kind of humanoid creatures, but they're not. Yeah. And kids aren't seeing humans being blown up and it gets around the code. Yeah, that makes sense. It's, it's such a, and and like I said, it's only something that I think I've maybe started to pick up on more now that I've got, you know, like a seven, eight year old and we're watching some of the things that I can remember. And, you know, I was thinking like Adam Sandler, yeah, it's kids movie. I'll I'll show him something that I love. That's kind of, you know, for his age group, it's fine. And then I'm sitting there now, obviously he's, he's young enough that like 90% of it went over his head, but I was like, Jesus Christ, this is absolutely insane. Well, the stakes are different when you're a kid. (laughs) Yeah. And then, you know, adult stakes to make something interesting drama for adults. There has to be life and death or your child or your health or vast sums of money or your reputation or your left leg. They're going to take your left leg. So adult themes, and I assume they have that on cable to go adult themes. You're not going to see any titty, but we're going to talk about titty. And, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I was like to ruin rock songs for my wife. I go, this is about heroin. This is about Coke. This is about sex. Oh, that's this sex act specifically. She'll go, this is not a song about that. And I go, yeah, it is honey. <laughs> and I always like break down the sex, drugs and rock and roll, man. She's like, thanks for ruining the song for me. <laughs> yeah. I, and it's funny. And I've seen that happen more and more recently as well. Um, you know, maybe the younger generation getting introduced to certain songs and, having their mind blown by the fact that uh, it's not actually about, you know, when you really listen and you go, wow, I listen to this every day and I had no idea. Well, I heard someone try to say that closing time was about being born. Move it to the mm-hmm. exit. I don't know. There's a if you listen to the lyrics yeah. of closing time and then overlay at that you're in the birthing room and you're being born. Like time for yeah. you to go out. Let you I could out see that into the world. I'm like, wow, okay. Um, I could see that. Good writing always has subtext. It's never about and good acting is never about the MacGuffin. It's always about the inner character drama and stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that they're more worried about the MacGuffin. I love, what were we watching? And the character's name was the great, oh, the new Muppets Haunted Mansion. Yes. Movie. Yeah, it's very good. Uh, uh, The bad guy is the great MacGuffin. Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
I was like, oh my God, this is perfect. And I'm like, I'm not even going to explain the Hitchcockian, you know, uh, fount that MacGuffin came from or how it's been used a million times. Uh, but uh, there's a difference between plot and story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I could see that. Um, well, it's been, like I said before, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. I hope we can do it again in the future. Um and have another similar chat maybe dive into some more stuff like i said all the links for keith stuff will be down below so wherever you're listening to the podcast um and again check out his youtube channel uh, i currently have it pulled up so now i have my my night my night's worth of binging uh ready to go um yeah wish you all the best uh stay safe enjoy your conventions and stuff and your traveling um and uh yeah we'll speak to you soon well, I appreciate it. Appreciate the time. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And uh, uh, rock on. Evil wears many masks, but pure horror wears only one. Support First Class Horror on Patreon for as little as $1. Can't get enough of the horror? Carve yourself a deal from official merchandise only on Teespring. Join us on all social media at First Class Horror. We have such sights to show you.